Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the LinkedIn series In the Pipeline. My name is Brian Zidden. I'm the CEO of an appraisal tech company called Regora. This series is focused on highlighting thought leadership all throughout the mortgage, tech, and real estate world. Today, we have a master in making real estate insights actionable, CEO and founder of Altos Research, Mike Simonson. How's it going? Great. Thanks. Nice to be here, Brian. Awesome. Well, for the folks who aren't familiar with you, can you maybe just give your background in terms of you know your story, Altos, and um, obviously there's been some recent news with you guys in HousingWire, so maybe uh, the, the story on that as well. Sure. So uh, I started Altos Research almost 17 years ago, uh, two, two bubbles ago, I like to say. <laughs> the uh, the uh, And I uh, have been a long time, was a long time Silicon Valley data software person. And uh, in 2001, I bought my little old overpriced piece of junk Silicon Valley house with a giant mortgage and I was, you know, 30 years old and, and, uh, and, and the NASDAQ bubble was like bursting around us. Uh, and, and it was, it was crazy um, what was going on. And, and I needed to know what was happening to my mortgage. And, and I started tracking every home for sale and just started building model on it. And after I did so for a few years, just for my own personal use, I, I started realizing we had better insight than anybody in the world. And uh, and so in 2006, 2005, we decided to commercialize it. In 2006, January 1 of 2006, we launched the company. So we've been running Altos for, for almost 17 years now. Um, and it's really about uh, how's the market? Like what's going on out there? And, and we've been... There's so much insight in the active market and in inventory levels and changes in those and prices and changes in those and, and price reductions and all of these things. And traditional real estate data was always focused on the transactions that closed last month or last quarter. And that's so long ago, you know, the house is on the market now and it doesn't get an offer. So it does a price cut in January. It gets an offer in February. That deal closes in March or April, and you start learning about it in May, and and like we can tell you right now what's happening. And so that's been the Altos focus for for this whole time. We track every home for sale in the country, and then we bubble up the analytics on it for the people who care about those things. So that's our journey. That's awesome. And so now now you've teamed up with uh, HW Media, and and that kind of just expands your reach even further, right? Yeah, you know, Housing Wire, we've been acquired by Housing Wire, HW Media, and, you know, they're a media company. And so we've actually done work with them in the past where, you know, there's a lot of uh, news in the data. And so the Altos data feeds a lot of media, but there's also a lot of, you know, uh, as a big media company, as a bigger media company, they have a lot of reach through the industry. And so uh, we're keeping the Altos brand and the product and everything intact, the team intact. And so there's really good, you know, reach for more people to find Altos and, and you know, use Alto, the Altos product as well as more, uh, you know, content and, and news for the, for the media arm. So we're working right. well together. That's awesome. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it's a, you mentioned in the beginning, you, you've been through two bubbles. I think it's, it sounded like the dot com and housing crisis. Would you count now? But would you, is it fair to say the third? You've been through three bubbles now? I mean, you know, it's funny. Um, uh, I have over the time, I have a, a, a developed a model for understanding, like, what is a bubble? Is it a bubble? Mm -hmm. And there's, there's like three or four stages in there. The first stage is like, you go, like, oh, hey, my, my buddy, you made a lot of money. But you know you deserved it. You worked hard. You were you like you were in front of it. Good for you. And then you look around. And then stage two is is like wow, like everybody's making money. <laughs> What's going on here, right? And then you're like, am I missing something? And then the third stage is you're like, wait a minute, that guy, like that guy is a he's he's not smart. He might be criminal, right? Like I, I don't trust that guy. And that guy's making money. That's when you know it's a bubble. And, uh, and so, you know, like I replied that to like, you know, the crypto markets last, uh, yeah. last fall, right. I was just about to say crypto. Yeah. <laughs> and it sure feel like, that, like, yeah. gee, that fit my, my model. And, you know, in Silicon Valley in 2000, 99, 2000 was nuts. And then the housing market in 2005, six, seven 
was nuts. And so, you know, like we have uh, housing in the last couple of years doesn't hit to me that third, uh, that third trigger hmm. Interesting. yet. Um, you know, there's some, you know, there are people who are, uh, there's people who are over leveraged. There's people who are, you know, they're hustling deals and things, but, um, but it's almost like, uh, you know, it, it like the, the, it backed off before it got too bubbly. So that's a, that's just a, an observation that maybe that means we escape the, you know, the worst of a big bubble correction. Uh, which is very different from like, you know, crypto right now, which was, you know, you could like, is in a harsh, you know, 90% correction world. Right. Gotcha. Okay. So that, 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 that's actually a really interesting framework, a little more qualitative from the insights guy. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so that, that it's like, like I said, a good, good segue maybe. And so, you know, we're on the way down. Like what, what do you think this does look like then for the next, you know, year or two, you know, how, how do you kind of tell the story of the real estate market moving forward? So, you know, we have, we track every home for sale in the country, right? Every week. And um, the the interesting observation right now is that while we have 60% more homes on the market to end the year than we did to start the year, it, you know, and 60% more is a lot. We're at, you know, ultra, ultra low. We're still 36, 37% fewer than we had at the end of 2019. Hmm. So, um one of the things that makes it hard to predict total Armageddon for the housing market is that in the supply demand equation, supply is still pretty restricted. Um, and, and there is a lot of reason to believe that it will remain relatively constricted. Uh, you know, and in 2008, 9, 10, supply was, was, like climbing rapidly and and it was distressed sellers who a couldn't afford their loan and b were upside down and you know like all of all of the things and you can't sell the house so those are the three things that happen you you're upside down on the loan and you can't afford it and uh you can't sell the house then you start walking away from mortgages mm -hmm. um and in this moment you know we have almost nobody's upside down and everybody's locked into affordable payments. So even if you get price reduction, if, you know, prices coming down, it's hard to envision total Armageddon uh, of, of, you know, housing bubble. That being said, like, you know, there's some risks out there. Like I had, I had no idea that rates would get to seven and a quarter percent this year. No, like I, I don't predict mortgage rates. And at the beginning of last year, it was like, you know, we were at three and we expect it to go up at three to four and a half or five would have been shocking, you know, would have been like a shock to the system, but we could see it. I could, you know, you could see it happening. And then, but to seven and a half and, and the market stopped cold at seven and a half. So in a world where rates climb next year, if they climbed above seven, seven and a quarter, seven and a half, like, like there's a lot of, there's still a lot of pain to be had in the market. If that happens mm -hmm. on the other hand, if they drift lower into the fives, five and a half, like maybe the market escapes without, you know, like people want to buy houses at five and a half percent. Right. But to your point earlier, it's actually, I haven't heard that stat, you know, in terms of like the supply still being down and maybe this isn't your wheelhouse necessarily, but like if there's such an affordability problem, supply is low, why aren't like home builders jumping on like building affordable housing? Like why, why well, is the supply going to stay low? So home builders are, have been building, right? There's record numbers of new homes in construction and, you know, they were, they're building plenty. They were, they were finally building plenty. They were, we underbuilt for a decade uh, after the, the, you know, the bubble burst and, you know, there's a lot of structural reasons why they couldn't, they didn't have the land anymore. They couldn't start building. We didn't have, you know, workers. We couldn't, you know, that, there were a lot of reasons that they couldn't build, uh, but they started, they finally got back to, you know, old normal levels of new construction uh, and then, you know, pandemic delays. And so those didn't get completed. And so there's a big chunk of homes in the pipeline that are finally getting completed so those are those are adding to new you know to inventory levels especially in places like austin and florida mm -hmm. you can see those um those hitting right now um but on the affordable side 
it's like we have a real we have a real uh, construction problem because we have an affor- a construction affordability problem to build at that at that low end and mm-hmm. so building affordable homes is a really tricky um you know equation for for home builders gotcha to, to like you know go build like hey what we want to do is build affordable it's like it faces a lot of hurdles and so you know at some right like we have uh you know affordability is a funny thing because if you watch over the past decade rates have been falling and homes have been getting more affordable then like and significantly more affordable. and then over the pandemic they shot up and we basically ate a couple of years of that affordability gains mm-hmm. is sort of where we are now um and and so um and so like that that has um and, and then we spike the rates and that makes things even less affordable. So we like, we have that mix uh, yeah. in there right now. And so we have a, um, you know, like you got a construction, like there's a fair number of uh, properties that come through construction. And really it's like the, the price is going to be a function of that supply, but, but the demand side and the demand side is like household formation Household formation is like, am I worried about a recession and losing my job? I stop buying. Like, and so those factors are really like like uh what what um you know I think remain to be seen for for the next year. Like how hard does a recession hit? Right. So given given some of that uncertainty, and we have a lot of mortgage folks that watch this. So, you know, given some of that uncertainty, but you know, obviously you, you there's a lot of insights, data oriented stuff out there. How would you recommend? lenders and maybe more specifically their loan officers kind of tell the story to borrowers or, or prospective borrowers today to kind of improve that experience? Yeah. You know, uh, it's funny that right now everybody is worried about what's going to happen. And like, so there's this ton of fear in the market. Um, and, you know, the the antidote to fear is actually like real data and say, here is what's happening. And so in a world where we have, you know, like there is more supply than than you had any time, you know, for the last couple of years, if you're a buyer, you actually have more, you have, you have more buying opportunity than you've had in several years now. And like, that's encouraging. Um, if, you know, as rates, and we can show this, as rates drifted down, like, uh, you know, they spiked to six and a half percent first half of the year. They drifted back down to like closer to five in July and August. And then and then uh, at the first week of September, they spiked again. And we could see inventory levels in July and August had leveled off across the country, started coming down for the fall. And then when rates spiked again, over six, over seven, we could watch inventory start climbing September and October, like late in the year, which is very unusual. Mm -hmm. So you could see that stopping uh, the market that like that above six, above seven really stopped it cold. So, um, so then, you know, while we're talking to buyers, it's like, and and buyers and sellers, it's like, you know, we can see that people want to buy homes. We can see that they feel an affordability threshold around five and a half percent. So as rates start climbing down as a buyer, your competition starts heating up and, but your supply is, is like significantly better than it has been in a bunch of years. At the same time, you know, your supply isn't likely to go four times bigger, like huge supply, there aren't those signals like the, the bubble bursting. So sitting on the sidelines, if you've got a mortgage at a rate you can afford and you can you now have opportunity to find homes that, that you can afford and you don't have to overbid for them, like those are better conditions than you've had for a long time. And waiting to find another better deal maybe in the future, there's a lot of risk in that wait. So like using the data to communicate to buyers and sellers is how we antidote the fear. Yeah, no, I think that that's really great advice, especially in a world that's dominated by like headlines and not actual, you know, <laughs> data insights for the most part. So exactly. Everybody's got opinion on it. And, you know, on top of it, it and it may be, look, it may be that some people, some buyers are going to wait, right? They're going to wait it out this year and that's fine. And then what the data is good for is like, look, like I want my clients to be informed when you're ready 
I'm just going to send you my market report every week so, so that you keep your eyes on the market. Then when you're ready, call me when you're ready, right? Like not everybody's going to buy now and that's perfectly okay. Right. Um, and that's what, you know, you use the data for is like, you just want to be in their inbox and like, oh, Brian's the guy who sends me my market report every week. Like hey, you're an expert. Yeah. You're the expert. Right. Yeah. No, I think, yeah. that, I think that's great. People are, if there was ever that talk around like the loan officer and the expert going away and it all being self-serve, I think now is a time more than ever that people want to deal with someone who knows what they're doing. So um, yeah. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. So um, awesome. Well, yeah, this was great. Super helpful in terms of, you know, providing some feedback in terms of where we're at. I, I love the the three phases. I'm going to definitely, you know, take that away from this. Is, this is my first cycle. So hopefully I'll be able to spot the next one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was great. Please it was great. God, just one more bubble. I won't screw this one up, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Need one more crypto bubble. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, well, great having you. Thanks for stopping by. All right, um, Brian. We really like it. Yeah, nice chat. Mm-hmm.